I will begin. Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you uh, for this day and for the wonderful weather. Just help us to uh, just use this time wisely, Lord, to glorify you what we do, Lord. In the name I pray. Amen. Yeah, I love this weather. I'm not joking. Like, I, I enjoy the cold. It's, it's refreshing. And it's cold enough that there's no ambiguity about what temperature the school should be. We're not at that, like, there's, like, some in-between temperature where they just do nothing and just let the air stagnate inside, that's the worst. So we're away from that. We have, you know, ventilation, which is good, but also nice, refreshing air outside. Okay, so um, I digress. Let me um, do one calculation for you guys, and then I'll take all your questions. Um, so what I want to do is just look at coordinate change, um, because I think it's probably wisest to not do that in class Friday. So I want to do it somewhere. I should do it here. And um, so I want to look at coordinate change for beta versus the dual basis, all right, and, and components. So this is the interesting thing is that the components of a vector, the components of a dual vector transform differently than the basis. And let me try to explain to you why that is. So what I'm going to do. There's a lot of different ways to attack this question, but I think I found a hopefully minimally confusing path. And um, so I'm going to try, see how it goes. I thought about this for a while. And so like number one, OK, so first of all, backdrop, backdrop. We're looking at a vector space V over field F. Almost always that field's going to be the reals for us at this point. Um, and the dual space, right? which, as we discussed, is linear uh, maps from V to the field, right? And I'm going to pick a basis beta, which is V1, you know, through Vn. And the dual basis, beta star, will be the upper one, the upper two, da, 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 the upper n. If for some reason, if you just have some kind of innate inability to use this notation, if it somehow offends you to use superscripts in this way, you could change the letter and use subscripts if you wanted. Like, I would not be offended. But if you do that, just tell me what you're doing. I mean, some books will just use a different letter, like use thetas instead of upper v's, all right? But I found the up-down notation to be helpful personally, so I'm going to use it. Um, and how did we define these things? Where here was their definition, v upper i acting on v lower j was by definition, right, by construction, Kronecker delta ij and vi is a mapping from v to f linear. So that, you know, we linearly extend the dual basis off the, off the basis. All right, so now that I have reminded you the rules of the game, let's look at coordinate change. And so, we're going to introduce another basis, let's say beta bar, v bar 1, v, you know, v bar 2, v bar n, and it has dual basis, beta bar star, <laughs> v bar upper 1, v bar upper n, and the dual, the star, the, the, the bar basis is also defined in the same way, v bar upper i, acting on v bar lower j, well, that's Kronecker delta ij, all right, extended linearly. So same song and dance. The question then is, how do these two different bases and dual bases interface? Um, OK, so we've got to start somewhere. So here's where I'm going to start. Um, actually, I'll start right here. So number one, let's assume so assume that v bar lower i is equal to the sum over k. And all the sums will be from 1 to n. So I'm just going to write sum k, OK? And then p lower i, and then upper k like this, v lower k. So what I'm saying is, and the p's are constants, right? We can do this because the v's and the v bars both form a basis, right? So there have to exist constants p, i, k, such that each v bar i is attained as a linear combination 
of the of the VKs. Does that make sense? That, that there has to exist this P? Well, there does. And then, that's my assumption. And then I'm going to consider alpha a dual vector um, with alpha equal to the sum over i of alpha bar lower i v, um, v bar upper i. So I would say recall that alpha bar lower i would be what, according to yesterday's discussion? Alpha of what? How do we calculate the components of a dual vector with respect to a given basis? Yes. V lower by bar i. Well, I did turn it off. I mean, I got tired of not hearing my phone ring, so I turned off something, but now, now this is happening. <laughs> I can't win. <laughs> um, actually, I can't win. If I'd followed my notes, I wouldn't even written that down because, I mean, this is true, but it doesn't matter. All right. Um, so here's the actual. Oh, yes, it does. I'm sorry. <sighs> make up my mind here eventually. So let's follow it up, follow it here. So alpha bar sub i is equal to, like I just said, alpha of v bar i, all right? But what else can we do? That's alpha of what? Parentheses, right there, right? The sum, sum over k of p i k v lower k. But what can we do? Well, we can, pull, we can pull the sum out, we can pull the constants out by linearity of alpha, right? So this becomes what? Sum over k of p lower i upper k alpha of vk. But what is alpha of vk? What's our sort of, you know, uh, Smarter, well, I don't know if it's smarter, but more compact notation for that. This, we can also just denote this as, as alpha sub k, right? So what have we proved? Therefore, um, alpha bar i is equal to the sum over k of p lower i upper k alpha sub k. Now, if you look at that coordinate change formula right here, right, you can compare it to what I'm assuming as my starting point up here, right? And if you look at that, that's the same rule, right? I mean, in the sense, it's the same pattern, right? Like the change from the change from unbarred to barred, we just take the sum over the p matrix in this way, right? the role of the indices on the p as they relate to the basis for v or the components for the dual vector is the same. So we say both these stars both give us what are called, this is a contravariant, contravariant uh, coordinate change. So physicists will say something like, oh, I'm sorry, I can't do, I can't do. I'm a very bad physicist today. Let's see here, covariant, covariant. Covariant. I'm sorry. Covariant's the lower index. Um, so that's point number one. Let's move it along here. You guys probably have homework questions, so I'll try to pick up the pace here. Number two. Suppose you have a different matrix, Q, right? And suppose Q is the thing that relates the coordinates for a given vector. So for for x for x and v, suppose that x bar upper i is equal to a sum over k of q upper i lower k of x upper k. 
so this assume this. We know this is possible. We know such a matrix has to exist because, of course, we can relate, we can relate the coordinates of a given vector either with respect to the beta or the beta bar coordinates, right? So there has to be some matrix which takes you from one to the other, okay? Because that relation is also a linear relation. Now consider Are you, is everybody done with, with this piece right here? This just little nub? Yeah. Okay, cool. Is that like an uppercase S and not the case U or is that just regular? Uppercase. These are just regular. Okay. But you could make them uppers if you wanted. I mean, it's just X is a vector. These are both, you said V. Oh, these are low, the, 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 these are all lower V's. The only place with an upper V is this one right here, because it's the dual space itself, you know, that's a set. And up here, this is a, I try to put the, you know, whatever those are, what are those called? Do, serfs? Oh. Ah. Serfs. Ooh, I didn't realize I was using such a, uh, you know, arcane notation. I don't want to support surfs. Is that good? I'm trying to get away from that in my own life. Uh, I don't know. All right, well, um, let's see here. Uh, I can't, I'm going to erase this now because I don't think you, I think by now you've <coughs> copied that down, yeah? And it's cramping my style. So, So let's work it out, same kind of calculation. What is x bar i? <laughs> x bar upper i is equal to v upper bar, v bar upper i acting on x, right? This was my, one of my main points yesterday was that the dual basis of a coordinate system gives us a way of selecting a particular coordinate by just acting on the vector. It's a piece of the coordinate map, really. And so, by assumption, um, let's see here. So this this is just this is this has nothing to do with that right here. Let me call this thing star, um, star. So by star star, I'm really equating that to what comes next. That's the sum over k of q upper i lower k x k. Right. But of course, this is also equal to what? I mean, I can also look at that as the k dual basis for beta acting on x. Right? The kth coordinate of x with respect to the beta basis is also V upper K acting on X. But then you just have to look at what we have. What do we have? We have a, a like a function equation, right? This, this equation holds for what X? Let me emphasize what I'm looking at. I'm looking at this as it relates to that. This holds for, for all X and V, right? Thus, we get that V, <coughs> excuse me, V upper bar, bar I is equal to the sum over k of q uh, upper i, lower k, v upper k. There you go. That's the coordinate change relation for the basis for v bar. You notice that it is the same as what? As we assumed, so we looked at how the coordinates of a vector change, it changes the same way as the basis for the dual space. See? This star, this star star, and this star star, they're the same pattern for the coordinates of the vector versus the basis for the dual. And so the star star is in fact,
contravariant change in coordinates. So essentially, if you, if you read physics books and stuff, they, they will basically say the way vectors change, right? The way the component, rather, the way the components to a vector change, that's contravariant. That kind of sets, that, that sets the base point for their terminology. And then they compare everything to the way vectors change. So if you figure out, if you say the way vectors change is, change is contravariant, then the way the dual vectors change is covariant and so forth. But anyway, who cares? Um, well, apparently I do, but anyway. Uh, so then the natural question is, okay, we got your P's, you got your Q's, right? We found this interrelation between coordinates for dual vectors and basis for vectors or uh, coordinate, um, you know, components for vectors and um, basis for dual vectors. So how are the P and the Q related? So, do you, so I'll ask you guys now. How would you, how would you, how would you connect these two, these two, these two calculations? Any ideas? <clears throat> what, what formula relates these two? There's really two. What bridges the gap between the basis and the dual basis? I think if you just, it's already on the board, like, you know. Yes, uh, I think so. Oh, uh, well, that's part of it. That's not wrong, it's part of it. But I'm, I'm specifically trying to get at this one right here. Or perhaps this one up here. See, these marry the dual and, and the basis together. I mean, they're, 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 they're inter that's how they relate, right? So we could start with, for example, V bar upper I, V bar lower J. That would be equal to chronic delta, delta IJ, right? But making the assumption that we have P and Q as in 1 and 2, we can convert everything here to unbarred things, right? So let's do that. How, what do, how, do we, how do we trade V bar for unbarred things? V bar, so that's the sum, sum over K of Q, I, K, V upper K, that's my V bar. That function is going to act on V bar lower J, which is what? Now here's an important kind of life lesson for you. We cannot use the sum over K again. Why? I mean, we already used it as the thing, right? So logically, if we're going to build V bar J from VJs, which, which is be like basically use this equation star here, instead of putting a summation K here, see what you can do is you can go back over here, and instead of putting a K there, you can just change that. That's a dummy index of summation. So you can change that to an L. I can change that to an L. I can change that to an L. Logically, that's the same formula. It's just recast in terms of a summation index of L rather than K. The reason I need to do that is because I can't use k again over there, right? So I use my sum over l. I got my p, lower j, upper l, I think, um, v lower l, all right? You guys still with me? Is that right? Yeah. And then, you notice what's going on here. So these, these are numbers. These are numbers, right? Dual vector. This guy here, of course, is vector. So how does this all work out? We can pull the numbers out front. We can pull the sums out front because we have linearity, right? And what's left is just the dual vector acting on the vector. That's, that's how this calculation sorts out. So let me write that down. And then we'll be done with this almost. Let's see here, sum over k and L of Q I K P upper lower J upper L. And then we still got this V upper K acting on V lower L. What's that do for us? What's that? Yeah, change it to that. That has a name. What is it? It's that thing you say, huh? chronic or delta, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's see here. 
So that, that's the, the Kronecker delta, which is get, and then that is the natural enemy of the summation, right? So like, I really should, I've set myself up for the inability to communicate properly, or so let's say some over, some over k, some over l. So there's really, I mean, when I write k comma l, that's just a shorthand for the repeated summation, right? So we have Kronecker delta kl. That means we can either kill a k sum or we can kill the l sum. Which one do you want to kill? It doesn't matter. Let's keep the k. Let's get rid of the l. So let's put l equal to k. So what you got here is the sum over k of q i k p j k yeah so there you go that's the relation between the the Q's and the P's, what are they? If we look at them as, if we think of these as matrices. Think of these as matrices, what are they? Let's see here. This should be something like the matrix. Q, I, K times the matrix P, J, K equals to the matrix of delta I, J. What's the matrix of delta I, J? So part of the reason I won't test you guys on the up-down indices for matrices is I haven't thought through the entirety of the conventions for you guys, okay? So like my, it could be to be a proper up-down index person here. Um, I may be, you know, it's, it's conceivable that I should have, you know, instead of written, writing this, perhaps I should have written, you know, something like um, KI or something, you know, I mean that's, it's totally possible that that's maybe what I should have written or something like, I mean I, I'm not sure about what's the best set of conventions there, so that's why I wouldn't pick on that for you guys. But the point is, modulo some kind of convention about how we say which is the row and which is the column index. It's clear that you can make a matrix which has a row and column index such that that matrix times that matrix is the identity matrix, which is to say that these are inverse matrices. I mean, what this expresses is that the Q and the P are inverse matrices. Up to some conventions I'm being slightly vague about. I mean, this equation I'm about to box is not vague. It's completely, completely not vague. How this relates to a matrix multiplication is what I'm saying is perhaps vague. But I, I, anyway, let's see how's it go. So I think what I'm trying to say is if I is a row index, right, and if J is a column index, right, then when we look at Q, um, I mean, so first of all, some people would write something like Kronecker delta i and j to be more symmetric in the use of indices. And so anyway, this much is true. This should be a row index. That should be a column index, right? Is that right? Yes. And then when we look at this p over here, um, p, j, k, that should, I think, be a row index. I think that's, that's a column index, right? Because this is like, I mean, it should, the ijth component should be what? It should be row i of q dotted with what? Column j of p, right? So, sorting through my possibly poor notational choices. Anyway.
So guys, if you go back to the thing we did at the end of last class, we worked out this formula. Remember it? T, what, what was it? it? Was the So let's, let's think about what I did at the end of last class, but for a vector, T going from V to V instead of W. So I, I did it for T going from V to W. What would happen if instead you let T go from V to V? We would find the formula what? Sum over I and J of T, T of VJ being acted on by, wait a minute, curses. <laughs> I'll get it right eventually. We had a WJ acting on T of VI, right? So that would be replaced with VJ acting on T of VI. Basically, I'm putting W upper J equal to VJ in here because I'm assuming that the, the, suppose the codomain is also V. So this would be the formula, and then we, did, we had that times what? Times um, V lower J, I guess it was, um, V upper I, right? Basically, that was the, uh, the way to express T directly as the sum of you know, components, vectors, and dual vectors. So what, what, how would this relate? What if you, instead of putting, what if you did this in the barred basis, right? You'd have this, right? So how would V bar J times T of V bar I relate to? How would that relate to the ordinary, you know, without the bars? What's the relation, the coordinate change relation? Because this is, after all, this is the matrix of T, right? With respect to the beta bar coordinates the jith component of it, right? That's what we saw at the end of the last class. My point to you is, if you look at what we did today, how would the coordinates change? Well, you notice that there's two kinds of coordinate change happening here, right? The one is the, the, the v bar i, v bar j rather, which gets us to a, so what, a sum over, let's say sum over k, sum over l, right? So the V bar J, V upper bar J does what? It, it picks up a Q, right? A Q, um, upper J, lower K, let's say. And the, the V bar I picks up a P, right? Um, my notation, P lower I, upper L. And then we have V bar K acting on T of V. L, but to write it more plainly, what you're really looking at here is the ij component of what? You're looking at the ij component basically of p inverse t beta beta p when you sort through the notation here. Now we derived that through a rather different method in my notes, right? We just looked at the coordinate maps, we looked at the picture. We derive the coordinate change relation. No discussion of dual basis back there, right? But this is, you know, another way to attack coordinate change is by studying the coordinate change for basis and dual basis and putting it all together. Whether you like my previous approach or current approach kind of depends on your, your makeup. Um, I don't mean makeup. I mean like your internal <laughs> uh, prejudices. Uh, I don't know. What do you want to say? How you're wired. You dog person or a cat person? I don't know. You like gerbils or rats? I, I don't know. What, 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 what are you asking? Anyway, okay, enough about that. I think personally, I love coordinate change. It's a very interesting topic for me, but it's um, it is scary for students and it's hard for me to test on. But it's something I feel like I should talk about because it's kind of where the rubber hits the road for real applications of linear algebra. Coordinate change is is really really important, and so the the clearer a mind you can have about it, the better. And the only way to really get a clear mind about coordinate change is just to keep working on it and trying to work it out for yourself. You know. So there you go. All right, you guys have questions about your homework? I mean, maybe not. Are you just happy to be done with the previous mission at the moment? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. 
Ah, uh, well, of course, um, obviously you want to finish miss mission six, right? I mean, that's, that's kind of a, a no-brainer. Um, for pre if you're talking about, since people can't hear your question, I'll repeat it. So your question was, how should we, how should we best study for test two since there is a test two and we actually have time, um, assuming that we're, you know, not going on a mission trip for the entirety of spring break, um, which would be most of you, but not all of you. And uh, <laughs> um, <clears throat> so uh, I think the answer is pretty much the same as my answer always is, which is, well, you know, try to understand the homework I've assigned that I try to teach with homework, you know. Homework is not just what I do in class again, right? I, there's things I'm trying to teach you in the homework. There are things that I reveal in the solution to the homework that you might not have. I mean, it's possible that you've done a homework correctly. You didn't lose any points, and yet you've done it wrongly. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, if you look at my solution and it's three lines and you have three pages, you must adjust your thinking, right? Because tests have this unfortunate thing called timing, you know? And so it's an issue. And, well, there's also something to it. I mean, if you can calculate things with more efficiency, that means that you have a chance of drawing together ideas that wouldn't have been clear because they would have required too long attention span if it took you three pages, right? I know that for myself. Um, anyway. So I would say, you know, try to finish the homework. And then I would, I would, I would say probably the, I would, I would suggest rereading you know, the chapters, what, six and seven, and the two sections I mentioned from chapter 12. Um, I don't know if I did already, but I will soon post the notes that I'm going through. So there's those. That should be pretty, the notes I'm posting should be really easy to go through, though, because we've actually literally gone through them line by line in here um, for the most part. <coughs> um, and since you guys asked me so nicely, let's look at an old test. Like, ah, now you're talking. <laughs> Other questions? No? No old test? That makes it too easy? No. Oh, okay. No. <laughs> Come on. Wake up. I said, wake up. Wait a minute. What am I doing? My computer's not plugged in. It's like a, I would say it's like a bomb in a MacGyver show, but that's not true. Bombs and MacGyvers, they say three seconds, but actually it's a half hour. You know what I mean? Or any, pretty much any uh, action, uh, crime, drama of any sort. If there's a, if there's a bomb involved, somehow time, it's some kind of general relativistic effect because you have one system of time where the bomb is and you have another system of time everywhere else. Like, People are running through hallways and, I mean, things that would ordinarily take them like a half, you know, a good half minute are only taking like two seconds because they keep coming back to the bomb and only two more seconds have elapsed. And, and there's like a law that every bomb has to be like put off at the last second. Like, I mean, look at, try to find for me a show where they've disarmed the bomb at like 37 seconds. Good luck. <laughs> I, don't think you'll, I don't think you'll find it. I don't. Where are we? Oh, linear, linear, yes. Linear algebra. Let's see here. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, let's look at last year's test. Why not? Would you like to look at the one with or without solutions? With solutions. Ah, you guys are lazy. Dear. Uh, I can find it. Oh, there it is. Ooh. Hmm. Actually, let's play a game. I think this is a good game to play with you guys. So, you guys have been here. We are almost done with the material for test two, right? Like Friday, I'm going to talk about coset spaces and probably the. Um, the isomorphism theorem. You, can, you guys should somewhat foresee what I'm about to say. If we have T that goes from V to W, linear map, then we can look at 
v mod the kernel of t. Um, this is the quotient space. It's something like this. Um, and what can you tell me about if I asked you, what if we define this, let's say, t bar of x plus kernel t to be t of x? This t bar would be a mapping from the quotient space, v by the kernel, um, to a w in this context. Well, what if we instead of it, forget about the w, let's, let's define it to go to the range of t. I'm playing that game I talked about playing with you guys last week, namely that we can construct a bijection. It's, it's a little bit different though. See, I'm not just restricting the domain, I'm actually changing the domain. But can you tell me, like what if you had, what if you had this, what if this was equal to t bar of y plus kernel? What could you tell me about? What could you tell me about x and y? About x and y? If you'll allow me this small omega style calculation. So t of y is equal to t of x. What does that say about x and y? Not that they're equal, but we, we have that t of y minus x is equal to zero. So what's that say? Something is equal here, so you guys are not wrong in some sense. This says that y minus x is in the kernel, right? By definition of kernel. Now, y minus x being in the kernel will prove Friday means that that, that, if you'll allow me, this implies that this guy and this guy are equal. So what's that say about t-bar? We have possibly unequal inputs giving us equal outputs. Well, excuse me, how can I say this again? <laughs> um, excuse me, so we have t-bar of a equal to t-bar of b implies a equals b. What's that, what's that say about, that's to say about t-bar? It says it's one to one, right? So this mapping is essentially the, uh, it's a way to take your possibly not one to one mapping t and elevate it to a one to one mapping. And so the isomorphism theorem simply says t bar constructed in this way is an isomorphism. In other words, there's an isomorphism, and this is the fundamental isomorphism theorem, that v mod uh, v quotient by the kernel of t is isomorphic to t of v. So this, this right here is the isomorphism theorem. So that's the one thing I haven't taught you guys yet. I think that's substantial. We'll cover that Friday, most likely. But most of Friday will be spent talking about cosets, right? So that's the remaining topic. So now that we have that settled, that, that's pretty much, pretty much it for test two. So you guys, you've been here. What do you think is on test two? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Why are x and y not equal? Well, we have t of x equal to t of y. Would that mean, why would that mean x and y are equal? Oh, why, why, is, why are these equal? Oh, because we have a theorem, which I haven't proved for you guys yet, and the theorem says this. If we have coset x plus w equals to coset y plus w, all right, that's true if and only if um, y minus x is an element of w. So that's the uh, equality of coset theorem. So basically two, two representatives represent the same coset if their difference is, is, on, is on the subspace. That makes sense in the picture if you think about it. See, because like this example we were looking at the other time, right? So if this was x and this was y, Right, so like x plus y, excuse me, x plus w is equal to y plus w. How do you get from x to y on that line? What do you have to add? y is equal to what? How about y minus x, right? So that's the displacement vector from there to there, right? If you want to look at it like that. So in order for those to be on the same coset, 
in order, in, order, in order for x plus w and y plus w to be the same coset, it must be that the difference of y and x is on the subspace. But this is just, I'll prove this. It'll take me about 10 minutes of, of set theory to prove it. It's not a big deal. It's just, it, it's something we have to go through. You don't, we haven't seen it yet. Getting back to my question. So thinking about, you know, thinking about the uh, upcoming test, what would you guys forecast being test questions? Let's, let's play a game, see how good you are at guessing what's going to be on the test. Subspace, Subspace test, I like that. That seems like an, that's an I think that's, that's got to be there, right? Subspace test. I'm going to add subspace, subspace tests galore. There, I'm just going to, I'm going to level uh, up your, up your bet a little bit. What else, what else is going to, what else got, got to be on there? Linear transformations. In what sense? Proved, proving something's a linear transformation. What else about linear transformations might you think would be on there? We had a bunch of homework problems on what, like kernel and range? So maybe describing the kernel and the range, maybe. Maybe find a basis for the kernel in the range, right? What else is going to be on this test? Isomorphism seems likely, right? Any other guesses? What's the most important isomorphism we've been working with? before we even called it an isomorphism. Standard matrix, mm. I'll put that up in here. Let's put that up here. Find T beta gamma, yeah? That seems likely. See, your comment's not, not totally off base, but the one isomorphism that we work with all the time, and I don't always say it's an isomorphism, is this isomorphism. We got a vector space down here. We have Fn, right? The isomorphism is the coordinate map, right? Which, by the way, just for you guys, that is the sum i equals one to um, y equals one to n of e i to the upper i. <laughs> In that sense, it's built from the dual basis. The component functions of the coordinate map are, are the dual basis. Anyway, um, what else? Oh, oh yeah, so I guess I should put that up here. One to one onto bijection, right? I guess I'll just add, I, these are all kind of under the umbrella of linear transformation, aren't they? Isomorphism. Miss anything? What's probably the most important theorem that I've told you guys since I mean, there, there's probably two of these, but um, okay, fine, there's a family. Um, we had dimension theorems, right? But we've also had the rank nullity theorem. We have the uh, first isomorphism theorem, hopefully Friday, but there's a lot, I, it says a lot of theorems about dimension and the, um, certainly, well, anyway, let's, let's see what we got. I think there's one clear problem you guys didn't say yet, which is, here's a vector, here's a basis, find the coordinates of the vector, right? Yeah, so that's, that's something that students sometimes forget to study, um, and it's not a good thing to forget. So given, given x in v basis theta, find 
this, right? Find the coordinate vector of x. And that coordinate vector, you know, that x could be a specific numerical vector or it could be sort of a generic like ax squared plus bx plus c, right? You shouldn't let that stop you. So let's see what actually happened to last year's class <laughs> on test two. Now, your, your test two is a little bit different because I moved dual spaces and quotient spaces up to test two before they were at the end of the course where they didn't really settle in and then people just bombed it on the final. So I thought if I put it on test two, it gives you guys a chance to sort of see it, digest it, and then see how it comes back into play as we go through future topics. So that's why I moved it. That's the one significant uh, curricular change from last year, I would say. Uh, so, ah, looks like you're right. Prove or disprove the following subspace. So we got, what do we got here? X, Y, and C2 such that, ooh, X and Y are real as a subset of, and so what's this notation mean? V as a vector space over C. So why is that not a subspace? It's bold. Because if you multiply that pair by a complex number, it doesn't keep it real, right? If you multiply by I, for example, Let's be specific here. Hopefully I gave a specific counterexample. <clears throat> so 1, 1 is in, the, is in the W, right? But if we take I times that, we get II, which is not in W, so that subspace is not closed under um, scalar multiplication by complex. So it's not a complex subspace of, w, of, uh, of C2. Here's a separate question. What if instead of... What if instead of writing C here, what if I wrote an R in parentheses right there? Would it be a subspace if I change the field of scalars to R? I change the field of scalars for the for the you know for the vector space in which the subspace is lying to the reals, then this would be a subspace. The problem is that this complex scalar multiplication takes you outside of the space. But if you have pairs of real numbers and you add them together, you get pairs of real numbers. And if you scalar multiply a pair of real numbers by a real number, you still get a pair of real numbers. So this is a real subspace. If if you were working with a real vector space. It would be a subspace. So you change this just a little bit, it would be a subspace. Here's another one. We've got, uh, what do we got here? W is what? Oh, this is the null space of A, right? So we know null space is a subspace, but we should, you know, convince me you know what you're doing. So here we go, subspace test. Um, A times zero, zero non-empty, right? If I pick x and y and w, then I can look at this. I get that. I get that. I get zero. Consequently, w is a subspace by the subspace test, right? I probably gave significant partial credit to people who said, this is a subspace because it's the null space of A. But, you know, just be careful of the wording. If I have wording like, you know, give complete and thorough explanations or something, then I would want more than just that. Anyway, if in doubt about your explanation, just ask me. Uh, let's see here. This one, you just got to look at, tilt your head and squint and see that that is equal to that, which is equal to that. Actually, this is literally that. But rearranging my A's, my B's, my C's, you see that that is nothing more than the span of these three guys. So it's subspace. Trust me when I tell you that there are students who spent much more mental effort on this question than I just did because they have not taken time to appreciate the span theorem. I was told by the grader on your homework, some of you have spent, not, maybe not you guys, but somebody has spent many pages of effort to prove something being a subspace when my, line, my solutions are like three lines. This is the span of this. Therefore, subspace. You should recognize if you can see something as a span, it's very much worth your while. So be looking for that. It's kind of like if I had to make an analogy when you're in calculus two, 
and you're trying to decide if a series is convergent or divergent, right? Ignoring the span thing for what we're doing would be somewhat analogous to ignoring the nth term test in calculus two. Ignoring the nth term test is usually not an issue, but when it is an issue, you have wasted an inordinate amount of time trying to apply theorems which don't apply, right? Because nth term test is like so simple when it works. Likewise, span theorem, so simple when it works. That's not an entirely good analogy because there's many more subspace questions that the span is relevant to than the nth term test probably. All right, whatever. Oh look, hey, what did I say about this question? <laughs> you guys should have guessed, this would have been a good guess, right? What, I mean, we had to talk about this in class, the intersection of subspace. Remember I, I told you a story about, you know, the class I didn't give an A to. Yeah. So there it is. That was also a homework question for you guys. Here is a coordinate. Find the basic, find the coordinates problem. I do like two by two problems because you can actually find the See, the thing about finding the coordinates with, of a vector with respect to a non-standard basis in Rn, if I give you a three by three, if I give you a three-dimensional problem, you actually have to find the inverse of a three by three matrix, right? So unless I make the basis especially nice, it's hard to actually calculate that inverse without investing about five minutes of calculation, right? And then, even those of you who understand, at least half of you are going to get it wrong because of arithmetic stuff, you know? So it's just miserable for me. On the other hand, most of you will get a two by two problem right um, if you're thinking about it. And so there you go. Um, to find the coordinate vector of one one with respect to the beta basis. Oh, this is different though, I'm sorry. This is not just that straightforward question, is it? This is a sideways question. I told you that that was the coordinate vector of that. I told you that was the coordinate vector of that with respect to a basis unknown. Find the beta. Ah, this one actually requires a little more thinking. But this is kind. This is scratching the same itch as that homework problem you just got done doing, right? Where I gave you three pieces of information about the t, and then said find the standard matrix of t, or the t squared plus t, t squared minus t homework problem, find the formula for s. These are both kind of the same ballpark of ideas. I don't know. This one is a little bit tricky, admittedly. Number three is. Consider the following subspaces. All right. So your first problem in mission six is like this or first one or two problems are about this theorem. Remember I stated the theorem, the dimension of W1 plus W2. What was it? It was equal to the dimension of W1 plus the dimension of W2 minus the dimension of the intersection. That's the theorem, um, which I did not prove, but I stated. Um, so in this class, I actually proved that theorem. So this problem was more likely for them than it is for you guys. But nevertheless, this is a homework question you have. Yeah. On the other hand, what is more likely for you guys is to find basis for intersection of subspaces. Is that what this is? Oh, it is, never mind. I can't read. So, and how do I do it? I, let's see here. Oh, this one is, hey, this is, well, this is, bless you. This one's actually very forgiving because I did, I did a nice thing, right? I already set them up as equations, both of them. They're already presented as equations. So if you want to find the x, y, z, which is in both, you just combine the equations, right? So this semester, this semester in your homework, we've been exploring the question, what if they're not presented as equations? What if they're presented as spans? How do you convert those to equations? That's been something we've looked at in homework that I have not yet tested, but it's something we spent a lot of time on if you think about it. I didn't actually test that on test one, did I? I mean, we had those homework problems you spent a lot of time on, how to find the basis of the intersection. Like I gave you span for one, span for the other, and then find the basis for the intersection in Rn. Yeah. You remember that one, Bethany, you solved it a slightly different way with more variables, and I solved it, and then you guys were talking about, is it the same? We had conversations about this. That was this semester. I have to say this to myself, mostly to confirm I'm talking about this semester. It all runs together for me, you know. Ah, what do we got here? Relation of vectors and coordinates again, right? 
So, so much rests on do you have a clear understanding of the relation between the basis and the coordinate vector? You must understand. The definition is so much of what you need to understand. Right? So if I say that um, that's the basis and that's, you know, I'm trying to find the coordinate vector for that. Um, oh, and I also have this basis, trying to find the coordinate vector for that. Well, this one is easy, right? What's the coordinate vector with respect to gamma? A, B, C, right? The other one I use the, um, what did I do? This is uh, calculus, right? I can re recenter that at one using Taylor's theorem. And so I can read off that, that, that from calculus two or calculus one. Well, fine, that's only the calculus one I teach, and I haven't taught for a number of years, so it's essentially irrelevant. But anyway, I really feel like Taylor's theorem belongs in calculus one, by the way. It gives you the natural derivation of uh, min max and stuff. But anyway, second, second derivative test, especially. And then, um, so great. So direct calculation gives me the coordinate vector with respect to the beta and gamma basis. And then what is this P gamma beta? It's the coordinate vector, coordinate change matrix to take us what? From gamma to beta. So the gamma coordinate, ABC, the beta coordinate, this stuff. So that would be the coordinate change matrix, and then it's that. Yeah. I don't know if you had a homework problem quite like this one, but you've had homework problems that are like this, right? I mean, I don't think I've asked you exactly this problem, but we've danced all around it, right? Ah, yes, this is one you should have had up here. And especially, you know, I was asking what's especially important theorems. So I said, well, the dimension theorems, certainly the theorems about how to modify a basis, right? And those theorems, I don't think, for the most part, I'm not really so much talking about their proof. I'm much more focused on their application. I think you probably could prove them if I set up the problem right and made sure I kind of put your blinders on. Because the trouble with these dimension theorems is if you assume any of the other ones of them, there's almost like a circular argument to prove a given one. They're, they're all kind of like the same thing. Um, so, but this is a big one. We spent time proving that the kernel is zero if and only if the map is injective, right? So I, I do often use this as a test question, it's true. And I, a lot of times, sometimes I'll ask for the if and only if proof. Sometimes I'll just ask for like, this has just got what? The kernel of t being zero implies that t is injective, right? I'll tell you what I'm not impressed by. It's like, I get a person's test, I read it, and it says, well, this was a theorem for us. It's like. If I ask a question on the test that says prove the theorem, I'm not asking you to tell me, yes, this was a theorem we had. <laughs> but I think, I mean, come on. You know, some instructors see that and they go, wow, this student is so stupid that they don't even understand the question. No, I say that student is so lazy he hasn't prepared for the question. I prefer to, I prefer to see laziness where some other instructors prefer to see stupidity. You know, laziness we can fix. Stupidity, you know, eh. You know, barring unethical medical practices not currently available with current scientific, scientific techniques, you know, there's not much we can do. I guess there's Adderall. I don't know. <laughs> no, don't do drugs. Let's see here. Don't do drugs. Let's see here. I, I did have a student in a, it was Calculus two, and he said he had um, H ADHD or whatever, one of these things. And he started taking something. I don't know what he took exactly. It actually did like change him from a C student to like a B plus A, a minus student overnight. It was shocking. It, it actually really, really did. I, I almost didn't recognize his work. It was really strange. But for the most part, I don't see much improvement. Anyway, um, 